So I was just on Facebook and I heard from my friend Dave and my other friend Dave that there is a Celestron Omni 102 refractor on at Costco for 249 Canadian dollars. That's under 200 US dollars. Now we're gonna check it out and see if they have any in the store because if they do, this telescope is 10 times better than any other scope in that price range right now, Christmas of 2021. This is Learn to Stargaze. Hey buddy, let me get a new telescope. Omni AZ-102 telescope. Woo. Hey everyone, John Reed here from Learn to Stargaze and author of the Things to See with a Telescope series, including the best-selling book, 50 Things to See with a Telescope Kids, and the new book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, a book that takes you through the 200-year-old Messier list and organizes it by season. This box contains the Celestron Omni 102 Refractor Telescope, a telescope I thought I'd never see again. If you look online, this telescope appears to be discontinued, but thanks to a tip from my friend Dave and my other friend Dave, there are a lot of astronomers named Dave. There's even an astronomy club for astronomers named Dave. That's yes. true? Yeah. Oh my God. I was able to find this telescope at Costco for 249 Canadian dollars. That's just 194 US dollars at the current exchange rate. And as I said in the car, if this telescope is back, that's huge news. I get asked all the time, what telescope should I buy on a budget of around $200? And without a scope like this on the market, that's been a very difficult question to answer. A lot of members of my astronomy club would simply say, get binoculars or don't buy anything at all. But here's the thing. People are just as fascinated by the telescope itself as they are about space. If they're in the market for a telescope, a telescope is what they want. Recently, I've been telling people to look for a six or eight inch Dobsonian, or depending on the person, to save their money for a Skywatch or Star Travel 102. Most of the sub $300 telescopes these days are what Sky and Telescope calls hobby killers. These are telescopes that are so frustrating to use that they'll drive people out of the hobby entirely. Now I'm quite confident that this telescope is not a hobby killer, but let's open the box and find out for sure. Cue the unboxing time-lapse music. And just like the Inspire series, there are simple instructions on the inside of the box. All right, some instructions, don't need those. All right, let's go over some of the accessories. This telescope comes with a 20 millimeter eyepiece. This is the one you'll use most of the time. It provides 33 times magnification, which is great for deep sky objects like star clusters and bright nebula. It also has a 10 millimeter eyepiece providing 66 magnification. This is used for zooming in on the moon and planets. Now I noticed this telescope does not have one of these, a 2X Barlow. If you like to view the moon and planets at higher magnifications, this might be a good accessory to purchase. Since this telescope has a 100 millimeter aperture, it has a maximum useful magnification of 200 times. You calculate maximum useful magnification by doubling the aperture in millimeters. A 2X Barlow combined with the 10 millimeter eyepiece will bring this telescope to a magnification of 132 times, which is great for the moon and the rings of Saturn. This telescope also includes an image erect 90 degree diagonal. These are used to write the image so that the telescope can be used for terrestrial observations. A telescope with a normal 90 degree diagonal, which is a mirror inside, would produce a mirror image of your target. This telescope comes with a red dot finder. According to the internet, there are versions of this scope that have the Star Pointer Pro, just like the Celestron Inspire telescope behind me, but the simple red dot finder is the next best thing. Now this telescope comes with a fairly decent quality cell phone adapter, and that's primarily for taking pictures of the moon, but also if you know what you're doing, you might get an okay picture of Saturn or Jupiter with this as well. But with this telescope, because it's not equatorially mounted, getting images of deep sky objects is pretty much out of the question. All right, let's put this telescope together. Okay, so here's the optical tube assembly, and this seems very solid. We've also got a Vixen style dovetail, which is great because that means we can put this telescope on any other telescope mount. No looking at the sun, folks. Not a good idea. Wait a minute. Am I seeing this correctly? Oops. Now, I didn't know this. This caught me completely by surprise. It looks like this focusing assembly can accept two inch diameter diagonals and eyepieces, which also means we might be able to attach a pro astronomy camera and a field flattener 
to this telescope, which could be really interesting. That's why they didn't want anyone to have this telescope. It's too good. Test for train. And now the best part of this telescope, the slow motion controls. Okay. Wait, did you see an Allen wrench with this telescope? We need an Allen wrench. Here's a drunk drawer. To the other junk drawer. That's why this telescope's out of stock. Global Allen wrench shortage. All right. <laughs> Time to break out the tools. So now we can, we can loosen this bolt here with the Allen key. And then we put it in the telescope and screw it in place. All right, the telescope is assembled. The first thing we absolutely need to do before attempting to use this telescope to view things in space is to align the finder. I didn't put the finder in yet. There we go. Now this telescope is finally assembled. The first thing we absolutely need to do before attempting to use this telescope to view things in space is to align the finder scope to the telescope. Now this is done during the day using a distant chimney. So let's go outside and do that now. For a pro tip, stargaze from a chair. It really helps when using these refractors. So as I said, the first thing we need to do is align the finder to the telescope, and we're gonna do that using a distant chimney. So the first step is to get the chimney centered in the telescope. Turn the finder on with this knob here. When you look through the finder, you should see a bright red dot projected onto the sky. Use the slow motion controls to center the chimney in the eyepiece of the telescope. Then you're gonna use this knob here to move the finder dot left and right, and this knob here to move the finder dot up and down until that finder dot is centered in the finder. And as a final check, you're gonna go between the finder and the eyepiece, making any final adjustments to the finder scope until the telescope and the finder are pointed at precisely the same place. On first inspection, this is a really great beginner telescope. And Celestron, if you're listening, please bring this telescope back. It will vastly simplify my life. When I get the question, what telescope should I buy on a budget of only 200 US dollars? I'll have an easy answer to that question. And Scott, president of Explore Scientific, there's an opportunity here. If you could put your Explore First Light 102, the one with the focal length of 660 millimeters, on a mount similar to your Twilight Nano mount, but with slow motion controls, then that telescope would be the one that I would recommend to folks in this situation. And if you've watched my earlier videos, you'd know that I have a few rules to follow when determining what makes a good beginner telescope in the sub $300 range. And these are as follows. Does the telescope effortlessly move left and right and up and down? Does the telescope stay where you put it when you reach your target? And thanks to these slow motion controls on this altazimuth mount, this telescope passes these two tests easily. Note that these slow motion controls are extremely rare among beginner telescopes. You do find them on equatorially mounted scopes, but I generally don't consider equatorially mounted telescopes to be beginner telescopes. And three, can the telescope point high in the sky? Well, thanks to this mount's design and this 90 degree diagonal, the answer is yes. Does the telescope have at least four inches of aperture? This allows the telescope to collect enough light to see deep sky objects like star clusters, along with providing a decent resolution on those objects. This telescope has 102 millimeters of aperture, which is just over four inches. And number five, does it come with a red dot or bullseye finder? These are much easier to use than those tiny finder scopes that often come on inexpensive telescopes. And there should be a final test. Does it make people go, wow? Wow, that's so pretty. Very cool. Yeah, I can kind of see it from here. <laughs> Very cool. the dog. So cute. So cute. Look at her over there. Look at that. Look at that dance. Itchy back. Okay, now we're going to do something a little different. 
I've seen some complaints on astronomy videos in general that we don't spend enough time showing you what you can see through a telescope. And there's a reason for that. Your eyes are extremely sensitive to dim light. Cameras, not so much. It takes very special equipment to take photos of deep sky objects through a telescope. And when you do have this kind of equipment, you generally take long exposures that bring out the color in the objects you're photographing. It's extremely rare to use a camera to show what the human eye sees through a telescope. So what I'm going to do is take this telescope, put it on this mount, and then add a designated astronomy camera from this telescope. We're going to take short exposures so that the pictures more closely resemble what the human eye will see through this telescope in its current configuration. Then we'll take the book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, and go through a few of the fall and winter targets. Ready? Time-lapse section. So the question is, what's a good way to zip tie this? We did it! Okay, let's take some photos of space. All right, so just going through some targets from 110 things to see with the telescope, controlling the telescope here from the iPad. So we're starting off with M37. We can see uh, about what it would look like through the telescope. This is a 30 second exposure. Okay, moving on. Winter targets, we've got M36. So let's tell the telescope to go to M36. All right, here's a 30 second exposure. Okay, and here we've got M42 and M43 from page 46 in the book. It's pretty good. Take a screenshot. All right, now I've taken a 60 second exposure of M78. And as you can see, this one is really dim. It's just a tiny smudge. You'll need very dark skies to see M78 with this telescope. See how low the telescope's going for this one. Right over the neighbor's fence. All right, it looks like we've just got M41 right over the neighbor's fence there. M41 is on page 53 in the book. Moving up to M35, that's page 52 in the book. And if we look close at M35, you can also see a small cluster there, NGC 2158. Let's try M1, the Crab Nebula. And there is M1 about how it would appear in this telescope. So M1 is a supernova remnant. So the supernova happened in the year 1026, I think? 1054. Uh, and then the remnant, which is the gas and dust from the explosion, was discovered again in 1731. Uh, what about the Pleiades, M45? Let's try M45. And there's what the Pleiades will look like through this telescope. With the naked eye, it looks like six or seven stars, but you can definitely see about a hundred stars here in that cluster. And let's grab a 30 second exposure of M38. Very nice image of M38 there. And just for fun, here's an image of the Horsehead Nebula taken with this telescope. Now, this is not something you can see with the naked eye by putting an eyepiece in this telescope. This is something you can really only see with a camera. You need a really big telescope and really, really, really dark skies to see the Horsehead Nebula with just your eye. But the camera, even from the city, even with this telescope, can pick this up quite easily but it's almost time to take this telescope off the imaging rig, put it back on the original mount, and use it how it was intended, with photons coming from space, through the telescope, through the eyepiece, and right into your eyeball. So I contacted Celestron's marketing department to ask why this telescope was discontinued, and I didn't get a response, but I'm pretty sure I know why. 
other telescopes like the Celestron Astromaster 102 and the Celestron Inspire 100 both have focal lengths of 660 millimeters, but I'm willing to bet that all three of these telescopes use the exact same lenses. The difference seems to be that while this Omni telescope is made mostly of metal, the Astromaster and Inspire are made largely of plastic. It's possible that Celestron's profit margin is so much higher on the more plasticky telescopes that they wanted to remove this scope from their lineup altogether. And that's too bad, because for around 200 US dollars, this is a great option for a beginner telescope. Now, I'm sure you'll see this telescope listed at outrageous prices by third-party sellers on websites like Amazon and eBay. I recommend you ignore those. At over $400, there are better options, including Dobsonians and refractors on go-to mounts like the AZ GTI. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Celestron Omni 102 Refractor, a telescope design I hope we'll see again someday at entry-level prices. If you have any of my books, leave a note in the comments. I love feedback from my readers. Please subscribe so you don't miss the next video. And remember, the future is looking up. That is wind. All right. Well, I hope it takes that tree down so we have a view of the northern sky.